Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. I am Rajat this side. I am session leader for this session. Our next presentation, after two very interesting presentations by Ricardo and Gerard, would be on PM tiles, which is an open cloud optimized archive format for serverless map data. It would be presented in a video format. And after that, the author, uh, the speaker, Brandon Liu, would be available with us for the questions. So I request you all to be ready with your questions and ask it using the venue list questions tab. So I'll uh, start the video now. Hi, everybody. I'm Brandon. I'm here to talk about dynamic maps and static storage with PM tiles. So I know this track is about serverless. And I think I want to reiterate the benefits of doing serverless computing. Uh, so three of the main reasons for serverless are that it's very simple and easy, that you don't pay for idle time on servers, and ultimately there's less maintenance. So it sounds like a pretty um, idealistic goal to get everything serverless, but in some sense, a lot of applications on the web are already serverless. And the one I want to talk about today is actually video. So here's a video clip that is just about 10 seconds long, and it shows a video of kind of a satellite image zooming out from Chicago. Now, the interesting thing about this video is that it's pretty easy to understand how it's deployed. So you just have like an MP4 file and you upload it to a server and you can play it back using the video element in a browser. So video, um, it has a standardized format for a seekable video on the web platform. And videos also have codecs, uh, such as H.264, that efficiently pack video frames into a single file. And we usually don't need a specialized video server um, for basic use cases. We can just put them on a website and include them in a page. Um, and that's pretty well understood. It's pretty well understood among uh, most engineers and, web yeah, um, and also web developers. Um, so I kind of want to make this analogy, which is that videos are a lot like maps. Um, so in this case, we're looking at a straight, like at one single frame from a video. Um, on the other hand, you could look at a map, um, even an interactive map, such as one made with leaflet that also shows, um, let's say a raster or satellite image of Chicago. This one's from Sentinel-2. Um, and it's also um, made up of tiles, kind of like video frames. But usually when we think about these tile maps, we think about servers, um, since you can think about it like, each tile is a different API request, it's hitting some TMS server, and we run a tile server that generates the data, serves it to the browser as an image. That's sort of the traditional way of thinking about uh, these tiled web services. Um, now there is an emerging technology called cloud optimized geotiffs. And this has a very similar goal. In a lot of cases, you're able to use a cloud optimized geotiff and serve it directly to the browser. Um, it is, however, constrained by backwards compatibility with existing geotiff readers. Um, it's limited to only raster data. So if you wanted to have vector or other kinds of you know, data inside of your tiles, uh, those don't really fit into the cloud optimized geotiff format. Also, the directory size, um, which is sort of the headers of the geotiff that describe where the data is um, can be really big. Um, if they're multiple megabytes, it might, need, it might not be practical to serve those directly to the browser. Um, there's another format uh, called MB tiles, which is specific for the TMS tiling format, you know, like zoom zero, zoom one, zoom two, uh, that are squares, powers of two, um, but it's based on SQLite. And SQLite is a transactional database that is in a lot of cases overkill for a read-only use case. Um, and there is some tricks for reading a SQLite database over the network uh, using range requests, but that is uh, usually requires something 
like a SQLite library compiled to Wasm, for example, um, and it is quite complicated. So what I want to talk about today is a new format that sort of takes the benefits from COGS, from those cloud-optimized geotests, and, and also MB tiles, and combines them together. Um, so it's an open source format with an open source reference implementation on GitHub, github.com slash protomap slash PM tiles. It's totally specific to the Web Mercator tiling scheme, and those tiles are readable directly via browser range requests. Um, more importantly, those tiles can be raster images like JPEGs or PNGs. They can be vector tiles. They can be anything. And there's also some tricks I do to make it efficient um, and work really well with the browser, such as recursive directories. Now, I'll get a little bit into uh, the format of PM tiles. So basically, it is a binary format um, that has a header, at least one directory, and then all of the tiles that are just bytes in the archive. Um, so if you look here closely, uh, sort of um, these uh, blue parts in the middle are the raster or vector tile data. And at the very beginning is a root directory that describes um, a mapping from the Z, X, Y tile coordinates to the offset and length inside of the file. Um, so much like a video, um, you're able to kind of seek through this archive, uh, kind of like, you know, seeking from uh, uh, one second to the other second, but instead you are traversing uh, this tile pyramid. Um, and the parsing of this format is all done in JavaScript. Um, now there is some ways to make this more efficient. Um, so um, for PM tiles, um, all of the tile coordinates are stored in binary. Um, so each directory en entry is only, uh, is only 17 bytes. Um, so there is a maximum limit on how big a PM tiles archive can be and how many uh, sort of tile entries it can have, but it's quite large. Um, so here's another example kind of visually showing you a tile pyramid. So if you look at a uh, tile coordinate 000, um, it will describe an offset into the archive, a 100, another offset into the archive, etc. Now something interesting is that the header section of PM tiles is always 512 kilobytes. Um, so that is sort of um, lets you read an entire directory at once from the browser without these additional requests. Um, something else that's important for geospatial use cases is deduplication. Uh, specifically in the case of vector tiles, um, or uh, in some cases raster, raster tiles, you might have a lot of tiles that are duplicated, uh, such as the ocean or empty land. Or if you know there, you go into a pretty deep zoom level, and the same data is repeated over and over again. Well, those can be deduplicated inside of a PM tiles archive by having an entry um, or multiple entries that all point to the same offset. Like so, they would uh, only refer to that ocean tile once in the archive, and that can save a lot of space. Um, in a lot of use cases, such as global vector tiles. Um, you know, the Earth is 70% ocean, so more than half of your tiles might just be these same ocean tiles that are only stored once in the archive. Uh, and this idea of recursive directories means that in the case where your, um, your archive has millions of tiles, um, you don't need to download a directory all at once that has the offset data for the entire archive. Instead, it's organized uh, with multiple levels like a tree. So if you are requesting, uh, for example, here in yellow, a tile that's at zoom level 14, you might start at the root directory in green um, and at zoom level, let's say eight, it will, instead of pointing directly to a tile, it will point to a leaf directory. And the leaf directory will then uh, have all of the data for that subtree of the pyramid. Um, so in this way, you're able to scale this uh, range-based design to archives that cover the entire world down to, um, you know, a typical zoom level of like zoom 12, 13, 14. 
Uh, so how do you create PM tiles? Right now, the preferred way to create PM tiles is to start with the MB tiles format, which is the SQLite format. Um, and in that repository, uh, which is github.com slash protomap slash PM tiles, there is a Python command line utility called PM tiles convert. And that will pretty quickly convert an MB tiles to a PM tiles. Um, and how do you host and read PM tiles? Well, since PM tiles is totally static, it can just be uploaded to S3 or another you know, major cloud provider that has an S3 compatible storage service. Um, there's also um, in that repository a leaflet plugin and a very small JavaScript library to do the parsing of directories and the loading of the image or vector data. Um, so to recap, some of the advantages of PM tiles are that you can serve directly from S3 to the browser. Um, so you don't have to traverse any sort of process or you know, web server software. Um, it is the ultimate in serverless because you don't manage any sort of long running process. You just upload it to a commodity storage platform. Um, and uh, there's other techniques such as uh, splitting the tiles into um, sort of all of their Zoom based directories and upload those, but usually that, that doesn't scale that well to if you have millions. So another big benefit is that it's a single file um, that is scalable to millions of tiles uh, by design. Uh, some of the disadvantage those uh, um, of PM tiles is that it is not a database. Um, because if you change one tile inside of the archive, it might change size, which would change all of the offsets of the entire archive. So if you need to update a PM tiles archive, you essentially have to rewrite the entire thing. Now, usually, um, if uh, you are just copying from a different archive, that can be pretty fast. Um, another downside of PM tiles compared to a uh, more traditional TMS server is latency. Um, if you need to first fetch a directory and then fetch a leaf directory before fetching the tile, you've introduced two more round trip requests into your um, your uh, your application, so um, the user experience might degrade. Um, there's also a size penalty in that at minimum, even for very small archives, you have to read at least 512 kilobytes every single time just to fetch that, that root directory. So finally, um, this right now doesn't interact really well with CDNs. CDNs are usually oriented around individual file assets and not uh, byte ranges inside of those files. Um, so there is sort of like some serverless ways to, um, to translate between how CDNs work and how PM tiles work. Um, but that you know, is an area of active development as CDNs incorporate more serverless features. Uh, so finally, um, a major downside is compression. Um, usually, if you are serving uh, from PM tiles directly to the browser, you are not going to be able to compress the data uh, with uh, kind of generic gzip encoding, like content encoding, because that's not supported by browsers. If you are reading a range uh, from a web resource, uh, the header should be transfer encoding. Um, but in general, I have not found that is widely supported by web browsers. Uh, so finally, um, that wraps up PM tiles, which is a new open source format for serving tile data. Um, and uh, protomaps.com is a service that I run. You can download OpenStreetMap-based vector data to have a totally serverless map application uh, with a base map from protomaps.com. Um, and if you have questions about the format um, or you want to know if it's good for your project, um, feel free to email me. Uh, my email is brandon at protomaps.com. Thanks. Hello, Brandon, and congratulations for the great job, and thanks for your presentation. So yep. uh, first of all, let me introduce you. So Brandon is a cartographic technologist in Taipei, Taiwan. He's busy building protomaps most of the time, and which is a universal mapping-based system based on the OpenStreetMap. So Brandon, thanks again for the insightful talk. We have a couple of questions for you already. So I'll go with them. The first one is, how is the performance when hosting a PM tiles archive on an S3 with a planet scale tile set, so zoom levels up to 14 or greater? Cool. Um, so the question is about performance for zoom levels to like 14. 
And in general, the first load will be quite slow because you need to fetch not only the first directory, the root directory, but also one leaf. And then finally, yeah, I mean, then finally those tiles. Um, the one advantage is that in terms of my reference implementation in the browser, those directories will be cached. And those directories will also contain the, all those tiles nearby. And because in general, most, um, most map users are going to be panning in one local area or zooming in one small area, those initial directory, uh, those directories will be cached in the browser. So in general, the performance is noticeably worse for the initial load. It might take, you know, one second, a couple seconds to load the map at first. But then after that, it's usually more or less the same as a normal map. The other addition is that issue of compression because uh, those byte range requests don't work well with standardized like gzip compression. You're generally sending uncompressed data, which for typical vector data is maybe 30% bigger than normal if it was compressed. So you're also spending more time downloading for those tile requests. So there is that additional latency. For raster tiles, such as PNG or JPEG, those have the compression built in anyways. Um, so there is no, there's no effect there. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. So there is another uh, a suggestion come followed by a question which says that I get how this is better than MB tiles and Cox, but why is it better than simply uploading entire sleepy map tile directories to S3? Uh, it is followed by another question. Is it just that it's a single binary file? The main reason, yes, is that it's a single binary file. And in general, my observations have been that once you get above a couple tens of thousands or hundred thousand individual tiles, the overhead of doing like an S3 sync to a bucket becomes quite significant, especially once you're, once you're, once you're in the range of like a million tiles. There's two other things I wanna point out. Um, the first one is the deduplication is very important for base maps because in the case where you are syncing entire tile directories to S3 and you're touching the ocean, then uh, um, in that case, a lot of your storage uh, in S3 is just gonna be the same redundant data over and over again, just like a blank, like blue water tile. Um, so it's pretty wasteful there. Um, and like, and also downloading, if you're panning around and downloading ocean tiles, that's also pretty wasteful. So, so using PM tiles can avoid all that. The other important thing I didn't mention in my talk is S3 usually gives you some guarantee of being atomic. So when you upload a PM tiles archive, it's impossible to read a partial upload. While in the case of like, if you were uploading new data to S3 with like S3 command sync, then you could be in a state where half of the data has not been updated yet while the other half is still being updated. Uh, so that's not super important for a lot of applications, but in general, it is nice to treat a data set as one sort of atomic unit when dealing with it on S3. Okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, this uh, this makes very much sense. So I have a follow up question, which is, uh, which might sound very naive in general. So this question is regarding if I have a very huge data set which consists of multiple raster types or vector types. So do we need to create a single binary file out of it, or every uh, sub GeoT file or every sub PNG file would create one binary file after archiving? So there's no way to have like a heterogeneous data set. So each um, you'll have like a raster PM tiles, a vector PM tiles. Um, it's interesting to think about the the idea of having a combined archive, but you didn't. But in in those cases, you'd have to make sure your pyramids match exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in general, the approach is to have a separate PM tiles for each kind of layer. Okay, and uh, one more thing uh, which which just came into my mind is about the deduplication part. 
So you mentioned that if there are a lot of tiles which uh, represent oceans in level, and then it could, uh, because of redundancy, it could just be a wastage of storage to store every uh, tile out of it. So would there be any data loss in those terms, or is there a way to overcome that? There's no data loss because uh, it uses, in terms of my reference implementation, it uses like a hash. And that hash is based on um, on bytes, so it mm -hmm. will only it will only deduplicate in the case where the bytes match exactly. So it's lossless. Um, oh, okay. but, but that's also a disadvantage because if you have a raster data set like a Sentinel two, and all the ocean tiles are slightly different, mm -hmm. then you won't be able to take advantage of any kind of dedupl of any kind of deduplication there. Yes, yes, uh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question. So it asks about which raster formats are supported, either natively or through the PM tiles convert tool as of now. Um, so every raster tile format, so that means every image format is supported because the container is agnostic to the, the, the internal tile. It's just bytes. Um, I think there is the concept of metadata, which is just a JSON object stored in the header of a PM tiles. And in there, you're able to store a MIME type, such as image PNG or image JPEG. But otherwise, um, it is totally open. Uh, you could store, for example, um, things like SRTM height maps inside of it. As long as um, your client knows how to interpret it, then it does not care what kind of data goes inside. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, thank you so much, Brandon, for the presentation. And thank you for answering the questions. I do not see any further questions for now. So if there are any further questions, you can connect with Brandon offline. And thanks again. Have a good day ahead, Brandon. All right, great. Thank you.